Uh, our second speaker is Tim Rafgarden from Stanford University. And uh, like I said before, I'm not, uh, you, you have access to everything about Tim in your program. Uh, the rest of the, the, the three speakers remaining are younger than me, so I don't remember them from my graduate school, but I certainly remember each of them from uh, the time they were graduate students. And uh, Tim Ravgarden's uh, thesis uh, sort of uh, amazed me in its uh, generality. It's about, uh, it's about the price of anarchy. I don't know if he's going to talk about this. Uh, if he doesn't, then you should find out. Uh, since uh, working on the price of anarchy, Tim went on to work on the prices of everything and more generally study economic mechanisms and uh, uh, their efficiency, uh, efficiency and uh, computational uh, uh, perspectives. Uh, Tim uh, also wrote two books, uh, one on uh, algorithmic game theory and one uh, on, on the price of anarchy. I guess that's a book of his thesis. Uh, if you like his talk, like I'm sure you will, you should uh, check later his uh, website where he has many more talks, uh, uh, video talks of his lectures where he explains in much more detail the stuff he'll talk about today. Uh, please welcome Tim Rafgal. Check one, two? Okay. Uh, thanks very much, Avi. So uh, my goal for today is to introduce you to a few of the many points of contact between theoretical computer science uh, and game theory, and more broadly, economics. And you know, a lot of the times when you're preparing a talk, you kind of know most of what you want to say, and it's just kind of the beginning that's really hard to figure out, like what goes on the first slide. But, but then when you're giving a talk that's it's about computing, it's about game theory, you're at the Institute for Advanced Studies, there's kind of like a mandate, I think, about how you have to start, start the talk. So, <laughs> so, so what do game theory and computing have to do with each other? Well, well for starters, there was a single individual uh, who, of course, is here at the Institute who uh, played a major role in the founding of both. And, of course, I'm talking about John von Neumann, who we've already heard about and even, you know, seen the same picture earlier this morning. And, uh, you know, while he had worked out a lot of uh, his theory of games in the 20s, in particular his min-max theorem, Really, you know, the, the game theory really became a major subject and started having a lot of influence in the publication of his book in 44 uh, with Oscar Morgenstern. And just a couple years later is when he started supervising the development of some of the first, uh, the world's, you know, first computers. So first as a consultant on the ENIAC, but then also um, here as also Professor Valiant mentioned on the IAS machine. And uh, so, Von Neumann had some common motivations for both of these activities, specifically in military strategy and technology, you know, but I don't think his, his work of these two strands really interacted directly that much. And indeed, as the 20th century unfolded, uh, while there was tons of progress in theoretical computer science and also in theoretical economics, uh, those two communities really didn't interact or communicate much. And this talk, I really mean to contrast that with the 21st century, where there's been a very lively and useful conversation uh, between those two fields. But before I fast forward to the 21st century, I do want to just point out you know, one sort of revolutionary idea from each of these two communities in the 20th century, both of which really have fundamentally shaped the, the research that's preceded it, including uh, what I'll be talking about. So first on the, on the economic side, we have Nash's theorem. So in the von Neumann and Morgenstern book in 44, they were really focusing on two-player games of pure competition, okay, also called zero-sum games. Or when there were many players, they were thinking about how coalitions might form. And Nash really founded non-cooperative game theory, where you can have any number of players, and each player acts as an individual in its own self-interest, and the games weren't necessarily competitive. They could be, or they could have aspects of cooperation. So this non-cooperative formalism really enabled game theory to, in principle, be applied to many more situations than had earlier been possible. But even better than that, Nash's theorem, in some sense, gave game theorists and economists everything they wanted. It gave them a universal existence result. Namely, knowing nothing at all about whatever game you care about, just that there's a finite set of players, and that each can take on a finite number of actions, this game has to have at least one equilibrium point. Well, Nash called it an equilibrium point. We now call them Nash equilibria. So I'm not going to define that formally. I think you all have an intuitive sense of what equilibria look like, and that will suffice for the talk. Pretty much. 
you have a bunch of agents, and given what they're doing right now, nobody wants to move. They're all perfectly happy staying where they are. Now, the one, the one twist, maybe, in, in Nash Equilibria is you need to allow players to randomize, but if you just think about two players playing rock, paper, scissors, it is clear you want to be able to allow players to hedge over various actions. Okay? So Nash Equilibria, universal existence, giving economists, in some sense, everything they wanted. On the computer science side, and this is now a couple decades later, we have the invention and development of NP-completeness by Cook, Karp, and Levin. So this is something uh, Avi alluded to at the beginning. And basically, NP-completeness was telling computer scientists that we're almost never going to be able to get what we want. So what do computer scientists want? They want efficient computation. They want good algorithms for solving fundamental problems. What do I mean by fundamental problems? Well, we want to be able to predict how our protein is going to fold so we can do better drug design. We want to have more efficient scheduling of airplanes to make better use of airport resources. Uh, we might want to, in a big social network, find meaningful patterns. And most computational problems of this sort are what's called NP-complete. And for the purposes of my talk, you should just interpret NP-complete as meaning uh, very difficult to solve computationally, at least in some general purpose way. So, in other words, when a computational problem you really care about is NP-complete, you've got to be ready to compromise. Compromise can take many forms, and computer scientists have many decades of experience about different ways to do it. So, for example, you can resort to heuristics. You can solve your computational problem not exactly, but only approximately. Or you can narrow the domain. You can focus on small instances, instances with special structure, and so forth. Okay, but these do not, assuming the P not equal to P, NP conjecture, that Avi mentioned, these do not admit general purpose efficient computation procedures. And in some sense, theoretical computer science has evolved completely in the long shadow of this uh, widespread intractability. And we'll see how that influences the kinds of contributions computer science has made to economics. So what I want to do uh, for most of this talk now is highlight three, I hope illustrative, but certainly not exhaustive, uh, examples of points of contact, again, between theoretical CS uh, and economics. I'm going to begin with a model which, you know, on the one hand is near and dear to my heart, but I also think it remains, it's still one of the most vivid illustrations about how, in hindsight, it's really obvious that computer science and economists had to start talking to each other uh, in, with the coming of the 21st century. So it's an application that involves routing traffic through networks. Now, the reason computer scientists got interested in this in the late 90s was they're motivated by communication networks. And of course, the late 90s is exactly when the internet was exploding. So, you know, engineers have been thinking about routing data for a long time. But with the internet, really, we were for the first time thinking about routing through networks where you had multiple self interested users, like you do in the internet. And so that really called out for game theoretic or economic reasoning. So that was the motivation. But for the purposes of this talk, I encourage you all to just think about something you're all probably very intimately familiar with, which is vehicular traffic as you're just driving around on roads. The fundamental princi principles are largely the same. So let me introduce this model just through an example, and this is a very old example discussed by A.C. Pigou in his book, The Economics of Welfare, way back in 1920. So in the Bay Area, where I live, uh, between Stanford and San Francisco, there are two parallel highways. There's Highway 101 and there's Highway 280. If it's four in the morning, you should definitely take Highway 101. It's going to be faster when there's no traffic. But 101 is more prone to congestion. Okay, so it's more, it gets, it's more subject to congestion effects as it gets traffic. -y. So we can have a cartoon of that as follows. Okay, so here's one of the endpoints, here's the other. These are the two highways. Each edge is labeled with a cost function. Think of this as describing the amount of delay incurred by traffic as a function of the fraction x of the population that's using that road at any given time. So Highway 280, let's just say, takes an hour, no matter what, no matter how many people are using it. Highway 101, let's just abstract it and saying if an X fraction of the traffic uses it, it takes X hour. So if half the traffic's on 101, it's half an hour. If everybody's on 101, it takes a full hour. Okay? So Pagu was interested in understanding what would self-interested drivers do and whether or not what they did was a good thing or a bad thing. So let's first understand, you know, what do we expect self-interested drivers? What do we expect the equilibrium to be? And then let's ask, could we do better if we hypothetically could coordinate their actions? So if you were one of these drivers and you think about it for a second, you realize it's sort of a no-brainer what you should do, the way I've set it up. 
So every driver has what's called a dominant strategy, one action which is always at least as good as every other. And that's to take Highway 101. The worst case scenario on Highway 101 is that everybody's using it, then it takes an hour. And that's also the best case scenario on Highway 280. Okay, so there's no reason not to take 101. So at equilibrium, the outcome of selfish behavior, we expect 101 to be fully, uh, uh, fully congested, everybody taking an hour to get from S to T. Okay, and that's going to be the only equilibrium. Otherwise, people would want to switch back from 280 to 101. So is this good or bad? So it turns out this is an illustration of what an economist would call a congestion externality. It turns out you could do better than this uh, equilibrium. And, that's be and the reason it's inefficient is because drivers don't take into account the extra congestion their presence causes for other users of the edge. So in fact, any other traffic pattern would in some sense be better than that green one. But an altruistic dictator if, who could hypothetically control everybody's routes would be wise to split the traffic 50-50 between 101 and 280. Now, the drivers on 280, it takes them an hour, just what it took them before, but the drivers on 101 get there pretty quickly, just a half an hour. So the average commute time has dropped from 60 minutes in the green traffic pattern to 45 minutes in the red traffic pattern. Okay, so that shows you something which in hindsight is not surprising. You let people do whatever they want, the outcome need not be what an altruistic dictator would have imposed on the system. And so to measure this cost of selfish behavior, Kutsupius and Papadimitriou introduced the colorful phrase, the price of anarchy. And as a mathematical definition, that's nothing but the old commute time, the equilibrium average delay, compared to this optimal, i.e. minimum possible delay, i.e. 60 over 45, i.e. 4 thirds. Okay, so we'd say the price of anarchy in Pigou's example is four over three. There's a more well-known example uh, of this routing network, which is sort of, you know, popular, it's sort of a good thing to know at a, at a cocktail party, or at least if it's a sufficiently nerdy cocktail party. <laughs> so this is something called Brace's Paradox. This is from 1968. And so here's our initial network. So again, we have one origin, one destination, two parallel routes. One and X means the same thing as before. So one, it always takes an hour. X, it takes proportional to the amount of traffic that are using it. Now, by symmetry, at equilibrium, the drivers will just load balance, okay? There's no reason to prefer one route over the other, so they'll split 50-50, and the commute time will be 90 minutes each way. So, it seems pretty boring. Where's the paradox? Well, the paradox emerges, uh, you know, suppose Google X announces that their newest technology invention is a teleportation device. <laughs> they midpoint of the bottom route. And moreover, it has infinite capacity. Any number of people can use it. Okay. So what effect does this have on the network? Well, suppose you're one of these drivers. Okay. It's a no-brainer to use the teleportation device. Okay. So if everybody else stays the same, it used to take you an hour and a half. Now it's going to take you 30 plus 0 plus 30 minutes. That's an hour. Okay. So 60 minutes, 30-minute impro uh, improvement. Of course, you know, you're not the only one thinking this way. So actually, you, you expect everybody to make use of this new technology. So the new equilibrium, after adding the teleporter, has everybody on the zigzag path. As a consequence, the congestion on the upper left and lower right edges, they're now fully congested. They take an hour each. So the commute time's actually gone up from 90 minutes to 120. And this is actually the unique equilibrium in this new network. It's again the case that the zigzag path, individually, is a no-brainer strategy, a dominant strategy. So this is the paradox, that when you're dealing with selfish individuals, when you're looking at equilibria, you intuitively can only add resources, make a network only better, and yet the outcome is somehow worse for everybody. You'll notice that if we think about the price of anarchy in the second network, so what would be the difference between selfish behavior and the altruistic dictator, it's again four over three. And that's because, and even in this new network, there's actually no way to make use of the new teleportation device uh, to improve the traffic. Okay, so we'll explain that coincidence of the second four over three uh, in a second. So maybe one thing I'll point out, given that it's a, this is sort of a general science audience, is that Brace's paradox is, I mean, it's, I mean, I've shown it to you as a phenomenon in traffic networks, but it's actually something much more basic. The same equations that govern the equilibria of these traffic networks also govern the many other notions of equilibria, like physical equilibria. So you can, for example, and I've had classes of mine, students of mine do this for extra credit, you can take a bunch of strings and a bunch of springs, and you can tie these strings and springs together into a physical contraption, okay? And you hang the top of the strings and springs, you know, from, the, from some heavy weight, you know, like the bottom of a table, 
and then you hang a weight from the bottom. Okay, so that stretches everything out, right? The weight exerts force, stretches out the strings, stretches out the springs. And if you build it just so, you can take a pair of scissors, snip a taut string from the middle of this contraption, intuitively weakening it, and yet that weight will levitate further off of the ground. Okay, and you can really demonstrate this. Search for Brace's Paradox on YouTube. You'll get some extra credit projects from my graduate courses. <laughs> now, why does that happen? One reason, so one reason would just be it's just Brace's Paradox. The equilibrium is governed by the exact same equations. The correspondence is inelastic strings correspond to these constants 1, 0, and 1. Elastic springs correspond to the x. Travel time corresponds to distance. And uh, the flow corresponds to force. Okay, so cutting the taut string just corresponds to deleting the zero edge and recovering the original network. A way to see it directly is that when you cut that taut string, what really happens is it frees up two springs to carry a weight in parallel, okay? So to share it, the force that it exerts, rather than being forced to carry the weights exerted, the force exerted by uh, the weights in series, okay? So it allows two springs to share the load as opposed to each bearing the full br brunt of the exerted force. So that's Brace's paradox. Now, let's try to think about, you know, we've seen these lower bounds on how inefficient things could be. And for letting people do totally whatever they want, obviously we would have loved it if decentralized optimization resulted in a fully optimal solution. We're not that surprised to see that it's, you know, less than optimal, but maybe we're not that discouraged that it's pretty close, four thirds in these networks. So if, you know, if you're a graduate student looking for something to do, looking for something to prove, uh, you could imagine, you know, a good rule of thumb is always to be optimistic. So like I tell my students always, you know, what's the coolest thing that could be true, but you haven't yet falsified. So we, okay, we have two examples, price of energy is four thirds in both. Maybe it's never bigger than four thirds. That's sort of the coolest thing that I can think of that could be true at this point. So that's pretty easy to show that that's a little bit too good to be true. If we just modify Pigou's example in a very small way, so we used to have an x on the top link. Let's make that x to the d, okay, where d is big. d is, you know, 10, 20, whatever. Okay, some highly nonlinear function on top. So how does this change Pigou's example? Well, the selfish outcome is no different than before for exactly the same reasoning. The worst case here remains 1. The best case here remains 1. So again, in the equilibrium, we expect the top link to be fully congested and everybody's cost to be 1. What's different is that now, with dictatorial control of the network, we can do far, far better. How do we do that? We remove an epsilon fraction of the traffic off of the top and reroute them on the bottom, okay, where epsilon is small. D is big, epsilon is small. So what happens? Well, if you think about it, almost all the traffic gets from S to T almost instantaneously. One minus epsilon to the D, D powers that down to basically zero if D is sufficiently big. So almost everybody gets there instantaneously. A few martyrs are stuck taking an hour, but they contribute very little to the average. So as D grows large and epsilon goes small, the best fossil solution is going to zero. So the price of anarchy, which is the ratio, is going to infinity. So there's no universal upper bound on what this price of anarchy can be, even in these simplest of routing networks. Okay, but so you can't get, this, you can't get too discouraged in research. You just have to sort of take a step back so now what do we know is true? We know that the price of anarchy is small in these networks, and we know that it's big in this one, okay? And in general, it can be arbitrarily big. So could it be that there are relatively weak conditions on a network you could impose that guarantee under those conditions the price of anarchy is close to one, that the outcome of selfish behavior is not significantly worse than what could be attained with perfect regulation? So, you know, looking at these three networks, again, if you were feeling kind of very glib, you might say, well, this one's bad. It has a nonlinear function. Here are two different networks that don't have nonlinear functions. They're good. So maybe all you need is to just say there's no highly nonlinear function. That's sort of the coolest thing I could think of right now that would be true. Okay? Uh, and that actually is true, turns out. So this is a theorem you can actually prove. So consider any network. I should say the reason there's something to prove is because networks can get really big and complicated. They're not just two nodes and four nodes. But no matter how complicated it get, they get, as long as the cost functions have this affine form, AX plus B, A and B can be whatever you want for different links, then you'll never see a worse example than the two I just showed you. So in particular, Pigou's two node, two link example already realizes the maximum possible uh, efficiency loss amongst so these so-called selfish routing networks with affine cost functions. And so again, this network can be arbitrarily large. 
any number of origins and destinations. It doesn't matter. You let people do whatever they want, and it just won't ever drift that much worse than what you could do with full centralized control. So I wasn't planning on proving this theorem, but maybe just, you know, again, let me give you sort of a, you know, morally why maybe something like this should be true. Just sort of a, you know, rough proof by analogy. So instead of routing traffic through networks, let's think about electrical current in an electrical network, okay, between two terminals. So what do we know about electrical current? Well, so we know that on the one hand, they can be th it can be thought of as an equilibrium. It equalizes the voltage drop across any two paths between the two terminals. On the other hand, we also know that we can think of electrical current as optimizing something. Thompson's principle tells us that it minimizes the dissipated energy. So that's really nice. Electrical current is simultaneously in equilibrium, and it's an optimizer. Turns out, electrical current in electrical networks is just a special case of traffic equilibria in these traffic networks. It corresponds to networks where every link has a cost function of the form AX. Okay, so maybe X over here, 2X over there, 4X over there, corresponding to resistances. And electrical current is just going to be correspond to the corresponding traffic equilibrium. So the two things we know about electrical current actually says that the price of anarchy equals one if all the cost functions have the form AX. That's what Thompson's principle tells us. So we've generalized the model a little bit. We've, we now have affine cost functions, not just these pure linear ones, but you might hope that, you know, we know that it's not fully efficient, but you might hope that it doesn't break down too badly. And indeed, traffic equilibria in these networks do still minimize some kind of energy function, some kind of potential function. It just happens to not be exactly the right one that we care about, the average travel, travel time of the traffic. The good news is, for these affine cost functions, those two potential functions don't differ by very much. So because equilibria exactly optimize something that's an almost correct function, they almost optimize the function which we really care about, the average delay. Okay. So that's sort of a proof by metaphor about why some kind of guarantee for equilibria should be true for these selfish routing networks. So just to close the loop, I said the computer scientists were coming from a communication network standpoint. And to reason about communication networks, you really want to go beyond affine cost functions. And we know that this theorem as stated is false for affine cost functions. It's no longer four-thirds. But there's one aspect of the theorem that remains true for any types of cost functions, which is the structure of the worst case example. So one way to interpret this theorem is, look, I showed you Pigou's example. I showed you the price of anarchy can be as big as four over three. This theorem says it can't be any bigger than what you already see in this trivial two node two link network. And that statement is actually true whatever the cost functions. No matter what cost functions you care about, go hunting far and wide for the worst network you're ever gonna find, the worst network is always one of these simple pigou-like networks, two node, two link networks. Okay. So that's true even if they're not affine cost functions. Now knowing that, you can actually compute this price of anarchy, this magic number, for any class of cost functions that you care about. It reduces it just to a back of the envelope calculation. So, you know, if you open up page one of a typical data networks uh, textbook, the first order bit of a cost function, you usually use something like a delay function of an MM1Q. So here you should think of U as being some capacity, the maximum amount of traffic that a link can support, and this is a cost function which looks like this. So there's an asymptote at the capacity, the delay is very low when you're far from the capacity, and it shoots up very suddenly once you get close to the capacity. Now, people who actually manage telecommunication networks, one of the standard heuristics they use to keep performance sensible is they look at link utilization, in part because this is a pretty easy thing to measure. So you have some cable, you have some maximum amount of traffic that can be going through at any one time, and you basically, you know, stick your finger in it, and you see how much is going across it right now. And networks are often managed to keep link utilizations bounded away from 100%, because that's a good heuristic, or it's been empirically observed that that works well for keeping network performance good. So the theory I just described can turn that into, into a theorem, into a rigorous statement. So to quantify link utilization, let me use this parameter beta, so this is the fraction of a link that's unused. So beta equal 0.1 would mean that all the links of your network have link utilization at most 90%, okay? So using the theory I just mentioned, you can compute exactly what the worst case price of anarchy is as a function of this beta, as this function of your maximum link utilization. And you know, I've, you know we're all supposed to be in kind of quantitative sciences here and I've got you for an hour, so I feel like I owe you at least one kind of obscure formula. So here's your obscure formula. 
But this is exact. This is really the right answer. So if all I tell you about a network is that the link utilization is at most one minus beta, so if it's beta over provision, and I tell you nothing else, otherwise the network can be arbitrarily large and complicated, then, in fact, the worst case ratio between selfish and optimal behavior is exactly this. So what is this? Okay. Well, so let's let one go to zero, of beta go to zero. So that says the link utilization is going to 100%. This thing is shooting off to infinity as beta goes to zero. But that shouldn't surprise us because right at the asymptote, we see that these cost functions look a lot like super high degree polynomials. And we already knew that you could have unbounded efficiency loss for super high degree polynomials. On the other extreme, as beta goes to one, that means your network's basically empty, so there's basically no problem with selfish routing. You get a price of anarchy of one. The reason it's nice having such a crisp formula is you can plug in quite modest values of beta and see what you get. So if you plug in 0.1, so again, this is just keeping the link utilization down to 90%. They're still mostly used. It's 90% or less. Already this ratio drops to something close to two. And again, this is a worst case guarantee over all networks subject to this link utilization guarantee. Okay. So what did we learn by applying the lens of, the, you know, or basically the toolbox of theoretical computer science to these routing networks? So the model, it's an age old economic model. Okay, so Pigou was discussing it almost 100 years ago in his book. It was made rigorous by Wardrop and Beckman, McGuire, and Winston in the 50s. And there's been literally hundreds, if not thousands, of papers written on this model, largely in transportation. But uh, before computer scientists started thinking about this problem, no one was thinking about approximation. Indeed, the first experience I can remember describing this result to an economist was here at the Institute. I was visiting in 2002. Professor Vigderson was kind enough to introduce me to Eric Maxkin, who since then has won a Nobel Prize in economics, and Eric very patiently listened to my description, and he said, it's a very natural result. I never would have thought to prove it. And I've heard that over and over again from economists as I've told them about this work. And so, you know, and I've, I've sort of wondered, you know, why is that not true? Especially when I was a graduate student and I was terrified of, you know, finding the main result of my thesis, you know, in some 1972 obscure econ journal. So I had to tell myself a story. I needed a narrative why conceivably this might be a novel result. And of course, I still might be proved wrong in the future. But the best I've come up with is that, you know, really, even though this application had nothing to do with computation, okay, I wasn't, didn't want an algorithm, nothing was NP complete. Still, you know, as a theoretical computer scientist, I've lived my whole life in the long shadow cast by NP completeness. And I've absorbed the toolbox that we've all developed for compromising when you can't get what you want. And so when you're just analyzing equilibria in games in the wild, they're not going to be fully efficient, which is what you would really want. But turning to approximation, we can nevertheless salvage, I think, some very positive and kind of really new insights into economic models that are almost 100 years old. So I think that's what the CS lens gets you in this particular case. For the second application, I want to talk about something actually quite practical. Um, so this will be probably uh, maybe one of the more you know, immediately real-world real things that we, you know, really engineering projects that we talk about today. And so what I want to highlight here is how uh, a novel and large-scale auction, which is being designed as we speak, I want to point out all of the different ways in which the high-level aspects of that design have been influenced by work in computer science. So the story here starts in 2012 when uh, Congress a bill, uh, passed a bill which is sometimes called the Spectrum Act, okay? And the point of this bill was to authorize the FCC to run, design, and execute a novel type of auction. And the goal of the auction is to sell wireless spectrum, mo probably mostly to telecoms for wireless broadband use. Now that by itself is not novel. So whether, whether I don't, you may or may not have been aware of this, but the FCC for over 20 years has been running these so-called combinatorial auctions to sell wireless spectrum to, in effect, the highest bidder, whoever could make the best use of that technology. Here's what's different this time around. What's different this time around is the spectrum, which is most valuable for wireless broadband, is pretty much all already accounted for. Okay? The government just doesn't really have any free spectrum lying around to give away and sell. On the other hand, a lot of the people who own that spectrum are arguably not using it in particularly interesting or valuable ways. In fact, a ton of it is owned by just television broadcasters who, frankly, if they went poof overnight, not many people would notice. 
So we're talking about uh, broadcasters on the UHF channels 38 to 51, okay? So, and regional broadcasters. So the proposal here, which is very interesting, is to repurpose that spectrum for more valuable use. So this is actually going to be a double auction, which means that the FCC is responsible for simultaneously buying back licenses from television broadcasters and turning around and selling it to wireless telecoms okay, for broadband use. So what they've been running for 20 years are so-called forward auctions. So a forward auction is like when you're selling your house. Okay? You accept bids, and then you figure out who the winner is and what they're going to pay, like the highest bidder. A reverse auction is like when you're hiring a contractor, okay, and you accept bids, and then you, you, know, you pick one of them. Okay? They're going to provide a service to you, like you pick the lowest bid of any of the contractors. So the FCC is, has a lot of experience with forward auctions, selling wireless spectrum. This will be the first time ever that they've run a reverse auction. They've actually bought buy spectrum back. Okay? The numbers, the estimated numbers are fairly eye-popping. So the, the most recent Congressional Budget of Office estimates that I saw was that they would be spending $15 billion buying these licenses back from the broadcasters and are hoping to make $40 billion selling them to uh, telecoms. Probably some of you are wondering about, you know, it's a pretty big spread. And, uh, you know, as part of the bill passing, that's already been earmarked, you probably won't be surprised to hear. Um, so after covering auction costs and funding a new first responder network, which is relatively cheap, the bill claims to be hoping to have 20 billion of that go into budget deficit re uh, reduction, okay? And so I said one name was the Spectrum Act, uh, the other name, the real name of the bill is the Middle Class Tax Relief and Job Creation Act. <laughs> Because, I mean, are you really going to vote against a bill called the Middle Class Tax <laughs> Relief and Job Creation Act? Okay, so the numbers are big. And uh, to thicken the plot further, if you design these actions, auctions badly, terrible things can happen. Okay, debacles really have occurred. So one famous one was in New Zealand. This was quite a while ago, 1990. And they were just selling licenses to broadcast on TV. Okay, and it was a very simple setup. They had 10 licenses to broadcast, and they were basically interchangeable, okay? So you just needed to sell all 10 of them. And for reasons that I still do not understand, they decided on the auction format of simultaneous sealed bid second price auctions. So a second price or Vickery auction, in some cases, is a really good idea. Okay, here it wasn't a really good idea. But so here's what a second price sealed bid auction is. Uh, it's almost equivalent to eBay. So you write down a bid in an envelope, you pass all of those to the seller, the seller opens them up. The winner is the obvious one, the highest bidder. The price may not be the first one you'd think about. The price is actually the second highest bid. Okay, so the highest bid by one of your competitors. All right? But again, if you think about it, like in an in a art auction or on eBay, the winner doesn't really pay their bid generally. They pay the lowest bid necessary to beat out everybody else, which is basically the second highest bid overall. Okay, so this is a very sensible auction in some contexts. However, now imagine that there's 10 of these going on at once, and you're somebody who just, you just want a license, okay? You don't care which of the 10 you get, okay? You have no use for two, okay? You just want one. And they're, they're saying, oh yeah, submit anywhere up to 10 bids in these 10 sealed bid auctions. So what should you do? Uh, well, you could like pick your favorite number, like seven, and go all in for license number seven. You could say, well, you know, maybe not that many people are bidding for these, right? Maybe there's only like 15 or 20 people actually bidding, and then maybe I should bid super low on a bunch of them, hoping I get one at a bargain. It's another totally legitimate strategy. And one rule of thumb is, is if you have an auction where it's not clear how to play, it's definitely vulnerable to bad results. In particular, the New Zealand government was really hoping to make a quarter billion dollars in this auction, that was the projection. Uh, they wound up making 36 <laughs> million. And um, to add insult to injury, I guess for reasons of transparency, they were required to actually publish the winning bids and the prices at which things were sold. And remember, this is a second price auction, okay? So the winner pays not what they said they would be willing to pay, but rather the uh, next highest bid. One of these licenses, the high bid was for a half a million, so 500,000. The second highest bid was for six. Not 6,000, but six. 
okay? So someone got a broadcast license for six bucks. Now, uh, right, and then if you scale that up to sort of modern day in the U.S., we're also talking about two orders of magnitude more money, okay? So the lesson being it's that is people know they need to think very, very carefully about these auction designs. So let me tell you, so this double auction, it's currently slated to be run in early 2016. Uh, the, all of the details have not been announced, okay? So some of this is speculation uh, based on my conversations uh, with people and meetings I've been to. Uh, but let me tell you what seems has, has you know, uh, coagulated as the high order bits of the, of the auction format. And so I'm only gonna, fo I'm gonna focus mostly on the reverse auction because th that's just the part where you're buying uh, licenses from TV broadcasters because that's the part which really has to be uh, invented from scratch. So it looks like they're gonna go with a proposal uh, by two economist colleagues of mine at Stanford, Paul Milgram and Ilya Segal. Ilya Segal, incidentally, I also met for the first time at the Institute, that same visit in 2002. And so what they proposed is a descending clock auction, okay? And I'll give you some more details later, but first let me just kind of tell you at, at a high level how this works. So there's a bunch of broadcasters um, participating in this auction. And remember what we're trying to figure out. We're trying to figure out which broadcasters we're going to buy out. And if we buy them out, at what prices, okay? So you're probably used to ascending auctions, okay? But here because we're buying out people rather than buying goods, we start high and we go low, all right? So initially, so at every, every round, every broadcaster is offered some buyout price, which they can accept, in which case they can say, yep, I'm gonna take the money and run. You can have the license. Or they can decline, all right? Now in any given round, if a buyer accepts the price, that just means they proceed to the next round. That doesn't necessarily mean they're gonna be bought out at that price. We may ask them again next round if they're still willing to be bought out at a lower price. However, if a broadcaster ever refuses and says, no, I'm not willing to pay 400, I'm not willing to be paid $400 million for my license, then they're kicked out of the auction forever, okay? And they get to keep their license and they get no compensation, okay? So the, the bidders still in the auction are those who still might get bought out by the FCC. So what you do is you initially start with a huge buyout price for everybody. Probably we're talking something like a half a billion dollars so that everybody in the auction contractually is obligated to accept that initial opening buyout price. But then, you know, the FCC says, well, you know, for the amount of spectrum we actually want to sell, that's overkill. We don't need to buy everybody out. So in the next round, we're going to lower some of these buyout prices. We're going to try to get, we're going to try to buy a bunch of licenses at a, at a smaller cost. And then that just continues. So the auction keeps lowering prices, and eventually some of these broadcasters refuse and say, nope, I'm not willing to be bought out at that lower price. So what I need to tell you more about is when the auction stops, okay? So again, you start high and you decrease the prices of everybody as the auction proceeds. So intuitively, what this auction is aspiring to do is it's aspiring, it's aspiring to buy a target amount of wireless spectrum as cheaply as possible. So what would be an example of a target amount of spectrum? So think of it in terms of TV channels, and this, this really is how they think about it. So we're talking about people broadcasting between channels 38 and 51. That's 14 channels. Let's say we'd like to free up 10 of them, okay? So we're gonna retain four channels worth of TV stations, but 10 of those channels will be freed up for wireless broadband, okay? Now, there's a really interesting issue, which is that these television stations are scattered across 14 channels, and they're not just gonna conveniently fall out of a particular 10 piece of channels, okay? These buyouts will happen across all 14. So a crucial part of this auction design is that after you buy out some of the TV stations, you look at who's left, who's retaining their license, and then you're actually going to repack them. You're gonna give television stations who still have their license a new channel. Okay, so your favorite TV station might go from channel 37 to channel 40. That's totally possible in this auction. So you take who's left and you repack them in a small amount of channels. Let me show you how this works with a picture. So suppose initially things look like this. Okay, so here each circle represents a, a broadcaster. The circle indicates the radius on which they broadcast, and the color indicates a channel. Okay, so there's three channels in this picture. You'll notice whenever two circles overlap, they have different colors. That's so that they don't inter interfere with each other. Okay, and that's a constraint. And if you think about it, if you have all of these TV stations, there's no way to use fewer than three channels because there's three different stations here who mutually overlap. Okay, so three, ch three channels are really necessary 
uh, to have all of these broadcasters without interference. On the other hand, you could buy out one of the TV broadcasters, they disappear. And at the moment, that didn't help because we're still using three channels. But now, if we do a channel reassignment, we can have them all not interfere with each other using only two channels, okay? So we just bought someone out and we freed up one channel's worth of spectrum after a repacking, okay? So that's how this auction's going to work. It's going to buy out a ton of people, free up a bunch of space, and repack the people who are left into a small number of channels, and then the freed up channels will be sold for wireless spectrum. Okay, so that's the gist of the auction. Let me tell you a little bit about how work in computer science has influenced this design and implementation. So first of all, the high-level design, these descending clock auctions, these are actually a sort of direct extension of some previous work by computer scientists, specifically my first ever PhD student, Mukun Sundarajan, uh, also with Aranik Mehta, who at that point was at IBM. And so the really nice property of these auctions is they have strong incentive properties. So if you're one of the bidders in these auctions, you have very strong incentives to behave honestly, okay? Meaning to drop out of the auction exactly when the price reaches your value for that license, okay? So you're not gonna drop out early and you're not gonna stay in too long. Ironically, again, even though these, these types of mechanisms, so these strong incentive constraints are inherited by the more general proposal of Milgram and Segal, but the reason we proposed these mechanisms, again, is because we actually wanted computationally efficient mechanisms. We were aware of, these of all of their incentive properties, but we wanted also computational efficiency because of the MP completeness and tractability barrier, and we wanted to harness the big toolbox of approximation algorithms that have come out of theoretical computer science. Turns out, the definition we came up with uh, is more broadly useful for this double auction design. Second connection, and this involves uh, a colleague of mine at Stanford CS show, I've shown. So I mentioned that in each round of the auction, you can decrease the buyout price of various broadcasters. And nowhere, the uh, uh, flexibility of the auction is that you can decrease different broadcasters by different amounts. So some you can decrease really aggressively, and others you can leave very high. Now why might you want to treat different people asymmetrically? Well remember, at the end of the day, whoever you don't buy out, has to get repacked, okay? And because some television stations interfere with others much more than some, you're really scared about having a very difficult to repack television station drop out, okay? That makes your repacking problem really hard. So if someone's really hard to repack, you might be much less aggressive about decreasing their buyout price. Whereas if someone doesn't interfere with anybody, then you can decrease their price as far as you want. You don't really care if they drop out and you're not gonna be able to buy their license from them. So there's a question of how do you do that? How do you choose how aggressively to decrease these buyout prices for different tele for broadcasting stations? And again, you know, the details have not been announced, but what has been being proposed in the preliminary plans are very directly inspired by uh, you know, really aspects of approximation, so heuristic algorithms for NP hard problems, which Yoav Shom was dealing with in a forward auction context. So exactly the same issues of trading off you know, how much money versus how many conflicts does a does a bidder creates, that's exactly uh, the, what these heuristics are meant to address. And again, the motivation here was because of the NP completeness of a certain uh, optimization problem. All right, so our, the computer science toolbox has more than just approximation as far as ways of coping with NP completeness. Sometimes you really wanna solve a problem exactly and you're really willing to devote tremendous human, monetary, and computational resources for doing it. And we have an example of such an MP-complete problem in this very auction format. I showed you the repacking problem, okay, with all of these colored circles overlapping with each other. That's an instantiation of a totally canonical MP-complete problem known as graph coloring. And it's a difficult MP-complete problem. There's really no easy way to solve it efficiently on all instances. So, other parts of the toolbox are being opened to tackle this part of the auction design, and this is led by Kevin Layton Brown, who's a computer scientist at UBC and an expert in this kind of stuff. And so he showed how these uh, repacking problems can be formulated very nicely as instances of satisfiability, or SATs. He showed how you know, there's a huge amount of SAT solving technology in computer science. The off-the-shelf ones still aren't quite good enough to get the performance they need in practice, so they really wanna solve SAT instances with like tens of thousands of variables, hundreds of thousands of constraints, in maybe a second or something like that. 
So off-the-shelf techniques aren't quite good enough, but if you encode additional domain knowledge about the interference constraints in this particular auction setting, then you can usually get the desired performance. So just a few seconds to solve really reasonable sized SAT problems. So that's a third ingredient from computer science, which is really kind of a necessary condition uh, for this auction format to be practically viable. Okay, how much time do I have? Ten minutes or fifteen minutes or something like that. Okay, all right. So let me just. Uh, what did you say? Five is better. Five is better. Okay, five is better. I'll skip this part. I'll just mention this briefly at the end. Okay. All right. So that was the second vignette, and so the goal of this vignette was to show you how computer science ideas have been influencing not only the theory of economics but also the practice of economics. So again, the high-level auction design, even though it's motivated by incentive issues, uh, the precursor actually emerged from work inspired by computational efficiency considerations. You know, designing greedy heuristics about how to decrease prices, that's bread and butter uh, kind of techniques that come out of approximation algorithms, that come out of theoretical computer science. Uh, and then fast, relatively fast, exact SAT solvers was also crucial for the viability, the viability of that format. One thing I skipped, and I'll just mention very briefly, um, is that in the forward part of the auction, there's a lot of folklore understanding in economics about which auction designs work well and which auction designs don't work well. So for example, can you, do you, can you get away with simple auctions or do you need much more complex auctions with additional features such as package bidding? And so there's a lot of empirical uh, rules of thumb, but really theoretical computer science gives the vocabulary to turn those empirical rules of thumb into theorems. So for example, one rule of thumb is that when items have complementarities, so this means you have a bunch of items where you don't have a lot of value for them individually, but you do have a lot of value for them in concert. So think about, say, a, a telecom who has a business plan which only makes sense if it gets coverage all across the U.S. And really, its business plan falls to pieces if it has just spotty coverage all over the nation. So now, if you have a bunch of independent auctions, it's really hard to pull off bidding in them because you need to simultaneously win in all of them. If you win in only half of them, it's a total disaster. So that's why auctions can be hard when items can, be can have complementarities. It's hard to coordinate the outcomes of multiple independent auctions. So the rule of thumb in the field then is that you really need complicated auctions if you want to be able to have good outcomes when you have these complementarities among items. But again, it was not previously a theorem. It can be made a theorem. And it builds on a field of theoretical computer science known as communication complexity. So it's historically thought of as a, you know, a pretty hardcore part of theoretical computer science. But it turns out it's exactly the right tool for making precise these well-known rules of thumb among practitioners in these kinds of combinatorial auctions. Okay. So let me go back to a sort of more theoretical, even almost sort of philosophical example to conclude. So let me return to Nash's theorem, which I mentioned early on in the talk. I mentioned how, in some sense, this theorem gave game theorists and economists who were using game theory everything that they wanted in the form of a sweeping universal existence theorem. And indeed, I mean, this, this theorem is so general, it, honestly, it, it spoils you if you work in game theory, because it just sets the bar so high for the applicability of any other result. So I don't need to know anything about your game. As long as I know it's finite, I know there's, a, there's an equilibrium. So that's great. But for many of the usual interpretations of a Nash equilibrium, for many of the reasons why you might care about Nash equilibria, it's not enough to just know that it exists. Ultimately, somebody, maybe the players themselves, or maybe some helper, a designer or a mediator, is going to be responsible for figuring out what one of these equilibria are. Okay, the players have to know what to play, either by discovering it themselves or by being told by some third party. Okay, but some boundedly rational agent has to figure out what this equilibrium is. So what we'd really like is we'd like a sort of more constructive version of Nash's theorem, which indicates not just existence, but how might one figure out how to play. So Nash's original proof, actually he had two proofs, but they were both based on fixed point theorems. And so those have a non-constructive nature that don't really give any clues about, about how to have a constructive version. So this, has been a, this was a major open question for a long time. And uh, evidence started amassing that maybe there could not be 
uh, universal, efficiently, uh, efficient computation, uh, efficiently computable version of Nash's theorem. The first instance I know of of someone really shining a spotlight on this question and also sort of raising alarm bells was Michael Rabin in a paper in 1957. So computer scientists in the audience will already know many reasons why Michael Rabin sort of a, a hero of computer science for his work in automata theory, randomized algorithms, cryptography, and so on. My guess is probably not that many of you know that in 1957 he wrote a paper on the intractability of computing Nash equilibria. But he did. So he says it's quite obvious that not all games can, you know, captured by the theory, encompassed in the theory, can actually be realistically played by human beings. Remember, 57 is well before we had NP-completeness, 15 years before, right? So what could he have meant by sort of an intractability result? Well, we did have undecidability in the sense of Girdle and Turing, and that's what Rabin meant. So he exhibited a game, okay, where actually the, there was a count, it was a countably infinite action spaces, where it was easy to prove the existence of a Nash equilibrium, but you could also prove that there was no decidable procedure that would give you that equilibrium. Okay, so this showed that there could be big gaps between the types of existence theorems that could be uh, shown and the types of constructive existence theorems that could be shown. Then later we did have NP completeness and we could prove intractability results for finite games like the ones that are squarely in the domain of Nash's theorem. So uh, Gilboa and Zemmel proved that various decision problems around Nash equilibrium are NP complete and there are a sequence of results showing that at least particular algorithms, for example, algorithms that attempt to quickly learn Nash equilibria are doomed to fail, do not in general work in a computationally efficient way. So this sounds like it's right in the wheelhouse now of computational complexity theory. We have a computational problem, namely given a game, find a Nash equilibrium, we know one exists, and we're starting to believe that maybe an efficient algorithm doesn't exist. Okay? And again, this is what many people in the community basically do for a living, prove these kinds of intractability results. And the first thing one thinks about, oh, maybe this is another one of those NP-complete problems, okay, like I mentioned earlier. But the answer is actually a little bit trickier than that. So Megiddo pointed out that actually Nash equilibria are not NP-complete, at least under standard complexity assumptions. And it's because there's almost a sort of type-checking error between Nash equilibria and typical NP-complete problems. So remember what a typical NP-complete problem looks like. I want to know in the Facebook graph, are there 100 people who are all friends with each other? Okay, this is called a clique. Is there a clique of 100 people in the Facebook graph? The answer might be yes. The answer might be no. And I want an, algor an algorithm to tell me which is which. Now, if I give you a game and I tell you to find a Nash equilibria, it's not a question of whether or not there is a Nash equilibrium to be found. We know the answer. Nash told us the answer. The answer is yes. The only difficulty, only difficulty, is in finding it, okay? So because of the lack of a binary decision problem underlying Nash equilibrium computation, it is, in a provable sense, not as difficult as NP-complete problems, okay? Because there's guaranteed existence of a solution. So, Papadimitriou then proposed to have a refined version of NP to say, okay, so maybe we can't prove that computing Nash equilibria is as hard as all this other stuff, but maybe we can at least prove that it's as hard as all the other problems that have guaranteed existence because of a fixed point argument, okay? Like Brouwer's fixed points and several other problems, okay? So that's a refinement of the complexity class NP. Uh, Papadimitriou decided to call it PPAD. So allegedly, allegedly this stands for polynomial parity argument directed version. Christos has tried to convince me that he was unaware that this was a <laughs> substring of the first five letters of his last name when he proposed it, but if you believe that, I've got a bridge to sell you. So, <laughs> so the 94 proposal was to say, look, if computing Nash equilibria is going to be intractable and we want to prove it's complete for some complexity class, here's a proposal for what that class should be. Okay? So that was just a proposal. There was not a proof of intractability. It was just really a program for intractability. And it took more than 10 years, but it was indeed proven, okay, mid-last decade, that indeed computing a Nash equilibrium is as hard as any other problem 
with guaranteed existence coming from a fixed point theorem. Okay, so formally, it, this is a PPAD complete problem. Okay, so it's like MP complete, but with this technical distinction because of the guaranteed existence of solutions. This is a difficult result. The proofs are real tour de force. Uh, das Galaptis, Goldberg, Papa Dimitri, Chen, Deng, and Teng. As far as how to interpret this, I mean, this is the way we would, in theoretical computer science, make precise what up till now had been sort of more of a folklore belief that there cannot be a constructive version of Nash's theorem that has as sweeping universality as the existence. Okay? So Nash proved Nash equilibria always exist, assuming P is different than PPAD, it cannot be the case that there is universal efficient computation of Nash equilibria. Okay, that's the meaning of this result. Okay, so in particular, if you want a constructive version of Nash's theorem, just like with NP-complete problems, you have to make compromises. And again, in theoretical computer science, we have many ideas for how you can compromise. You have approximation. For equilibrium computation, more realistically, you probably want to narrow the domain. Okay, so you probably want to look at games that are either not too big or have extra special structure where it's easier to understand and compute what the Nash equilibria might be. So what did we get from the computational lens, applying it squarely to the fundamental concept of Nash equilibria? Well, you know, what is, what is not a new idea is the idea that the Nash equilibria has problems, okay? There's a long list of well-known criticisms of the Nash equilibrium concept. For example, already the fact that it's not unique, you can have lots and lots of Nash equilibria in different games, that already makes its predictive power not as sweeping as one might like, okay? So there are many criticisms, but, the computational lens has highlighted really an orthogonal and I think novel type of criticism of the Nash equilibrium concept. Again, it doesn't mean it should be removed from the pedestal of being the fundamental equilibrium concept. It just means it's just sort of advice about when it makes sense and when it doesn't make sense. And the critique is that even with all of the, setting all of the other criticisms aside, the predictive power is diminished by the fact that we can't have confidence that boundedly rational agents or a designer can actually figure out what one of these Nash equilibria is, at least not in the general case. Okay, so again, in specific domains, you could have positive results, but you cannot have a general purpose constructive version of Nash's theorem. Okay, so just to wrap up quickly, so uh, I've given you a highly non-exhaustive, but I hope representative set of the interactions that have been taking place on the boundary of computer science and economics over the past 15 years. And I really don't think this is some fad. I mean, the interaction that's happening is only accelerating as we speak. And I think it makes sense. These are two communities that have a lot to benefit from each other, and indeed, you know, arguably even need each other to a certain degree. Computer science, right, many of the 21st century applications that we're struggling with really require economic reasoning to, to make good sense of them. I tried to highlight this with a network routing application. But if you look at the big data companies, you look at Microsoft and Google, they now have positions called chief economists, okay, up toward the, at the top brass of the company. So this is really, I think, a, a well-understood new thing. Computer science needs economic advice. In the other direction, com theoretical computer science is really uniquely situated to articulate computational intractability when it exists. And whether we like it or not, it exists pretty broadly in the world. Whether you're trying to run some auction at large scale, like in the FCC double auction, or whether you're just trying to understand whether or not equilibria are generally going to be realized in games, like we saw in the previous application with PPAD completeness. But the good news is, is because of our long history coping with intractability, we have a lot of ways of getting around it, a lot of ways to still make progress and get insights into fundamental models, even when there's intractability there. So I'll leave you with that. Thanks.